It's the day after the midterm elections and the gains for the Republicans were even better than expected in the Senate and in many races for governorships. I'm here with Jillian Tett, U.S. Managing Editor. Jillian, we knew this could happen. We knew this could be bad for the Democrats. But did anything about last night actually surprise you? Well, nobody expected a good night for the Democrats, but I don't think many people expected just how bad the outcome would be. Because what happened in the midterms was not just that we saw the Republicans take control of the Senate. In some ways, a really striking thing was the number of governors that turned Demo a turn Republican too. Okay, and what were some of the takeaways of the night in terms of what people were actually voting for? Because you made a point earlier that there was actually something of a discrepancy between the fact that a lot of voters kicked out the Democrats and some of these ballot initiatives and the way they voted on those. So talk about that for a minute. Well, the polite thing to say about the American public today is that they are divided and confused. The less polite way to describe it is a frankly schizophrenic. What we saw transpire this week is that voters don't like the Democrats, they really don't like the White House, and yet they actually like some of their ideas. In fact, many of their ideas. Sure. Classic Democrat positions like legalizing marijuana, supporting same-sex marriage, supporting abortion, gun control, and perhaps most surprising of all, raising the minimum wage. Sure. All of those ideas appear to be really striking a chord with the voters right now, but at the same time, the voters say they want to have Republican leaders. It doesn't quite stack up. Okay. Let's talk about voting patterns for a second, too. Turnout, disappointing, I think. Uh, in uh, a lot of these races, they took place in red states. We know that, uh, for the Democrats at least, a big chunk of their base is young people. Uh, another chunk of their base is uh, minority voters. They tend not to vote as much in midterm cycles as they do in presidential election years. Um, isn't this going to be a problem going forward? Well, unsurprisingly, the president has been very quick to blame the outcome on the low turnout by many traditional Democrat supporters. And there's a certain degree of truth in that. But the reality is that you are seeing an electorate right now that's very disaffected. It's not just as a result of the turnout or the voting on Wednesday. It's also as a result of the opinion polls. And we can see what kind of um, mood there is in the country right now. Sure. Uh, I want to shift for a minute from politics to policy, okay? Forget the racehorse for a minute. What can we actually get done in the next few years? Because you know the next day everybody's trying to be polite to each other. Everybody's being nice. It's time to govern now, set politics aside. Is that the same crap that they always say? Or in this case, might they actually mean it? Well, what's fascinating is that right now, expectations about what Congress can deliver are at record lows. I mean, we saw a survey sure. earlier this year which suggests the voters have more respect for cockroaches than they do for Congress. A Harvard Business School survey shows that if you ask Harvard Business School alumni what's the biggest single impediment to growth in America today, before, above infrastructure, education, things like that, you have politics in the political system. So expectations of meaningful action are rock bottom and low. And yet, if you look at what this outcome actually means for where you may see points of action, there is some reason for grounds. That's partly because the Republicans now have an incentive to show the voters they can get things done, since they now control both the House and the Senate. But at the same time, you have a president who's looking to ensure he at least has some kind of legacy when he leaves power. He's more likely to try and seek common ground where he can actually enact action than simply sit on his hands. And there are a number of points where you actually have Democrats and Republicans sharing some ground. Not many points, but there are actual areas for change. Do you want to give us some of those? Trade is one area that everyone ought to be watching right now. Oddly enough, the Republican Party is probably closer to the president's position in terms of supporting the potential free trade agreements with uh, Europe and Asia than most of the Democrats. Another area of potential agreement is the need for immigration reform strongly opposed by many parts of the Republicans. Personally, I think it's unlikely for any grandiose deal to be done soon, but it will certainly be debated. Um, energy reform is one area people are watching closely for the Keystone Pipeline. It's a key area that Republicans are pushing for, and we have had some hints that the White House might just might be willing to try and embrace that project. Tax reform, interestingly enough, is another key area to watch because both parties have a groundswell of opinion which suggests there is a need for lower corporate tax rates in exchange for trying to plug some of the corporate tax loopholes. And certainly the idea of trying to introduce some corporate tax reform is more popular than trying to, say, tax the wealthy right now. 
And no one should forget that the last time we saw serious corporation tax reform was back under Ronald Reagan, right. when you also had a very divided Washington. Last question. Uh, this is about the economy, okay? Because one thing you didn't note uh, in that list of possible areas of collaboration was, the, you know, the prospect for a big stimulative uh, package of some kind, something to give the economy a bigger jolt, okay? Or even something on infrastructure, which is an area that I think a lot of people agree needs a certain amount of investment now. Um, so that leaves the Federal Reserve essentially in charge for at least the foreseeable future. The Republicans are now in charge of the Senate. Richard Shelby, the senator who in the past hasn't exactly been all that cozy with Janet Yellen, is probably going to be chairman of the Senate Banking Committee. Um, is this going to put further pressure on the Federal Reserve now that the Republicans uh, are going to be in charge of uh, both parts of Congress? Well, Janet Yellen, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, right now faces two competing trends. On the one hand, you are seeing a Republican Congress that's likely to become a lot more critical of the Fed and likely to start pushing for a quicker normalization of policy, whatever that means. At the same time, though, the FOMC actually is seeing some of its most hawkish members depart very soon. Richard Fisher, who gave a barnstorming speech in New York this week, right. is heading out the doors very soon. So in some ways, in terms of the FOMC itself, Janet Yellen is likely to have less, not more, pressure to normalize policy and raise interest rates. What it may mean is that inside the Fed, there will be support for carrying on as they currently are. Outside, though, you may get a lot more shrill criticism from Congress, particularly if, as seems likely, Janet Yellen continues to sit on her hands. Gillian Tett, thanks very much. Thank you.